Welcome to Beer and Irons, How to Tenderize, Brine, and Cook the Perfect Chicken Breast. This is how we prepare all of our chicken breast meat, no matter what recipe we're preparing for. Often, we'll pre-tenderize and pre-brine the chicken breast meat and then refrigerate it for another time. This video is going to show you how to tenderize the chicken breast so it's easy to cut, easy to eat, and easy to enjoy. We brine the chicken breast meat so the flavor of the chicken breast is perfectly salty and perfectly juicy. Then we'll learn how to pan sear and then finish in the oven that chicken breast for a perfect evenly cooked piece of meat. Tenderizing the chicken breast. I have a red cutting board I use for my meat preparation. The cutting board is going to take a lot of abuse. As you well know, chicken breast comes in all kinds of sizes and thicknesses from all kinds of producers sold with all kinds of perks, such as natural, air chilled, free range, and the like. This recipe will help you create not only a tender chicken breast, but also an evenly cooked chicken breast. Which of these pieces of chicken do you think will be more tender? The smaller and thinner chicken breast or the larger and thicker cut of chicken breast? If they're not prepared with attention to detail, they'll both be miserable to eat. The smaller piece will reach temperature first and start to dry out and toughen up as the bigger piece reaches temperature. Dollars to donuts that even if you cook that bigger piece just to temperature and no more, it'd still be dry and tough. I want both to cook to temperature at the same time and both to be delicious. Some chicken breast meat is sold with the tender still in place. You can just leave it there or pull it free. In this video, when I refer to chicken breast, I'm referring not to the whole chicken breast. I'm referring to the half of the chicken breast packaged as separate pieces. Really, when I say whole chicken breast, I'm referring to the half that is boneless and skinless. Along with the red cutting board, you'll need three tools here. The needle tenderizer. I find that opening up the meat and deep into the grain helps the meat spread out when we start using the tenderizing mallet. The tried and true tenderizing mallet will break apart the fibers of the meat and, for a lack of a better word, tear the meat up a bit, but not so much we have ground chicken. The meat will break and tear some, but the final on-the-plate chicken breast fillet will look perfect. First, lay the chicken breast on the cutting board with the bone side down. To clarify, we're using boneless and skinless chicken breast. Lay the meat bone side down and with the apex or the thinner side pointing at your dominant hand. We're going to work from thin to thick. Work in a side to side motion as you get closer to the thick side. At the thicker side of the chicken breast, work in a spiral motion from the outside and then toward the thicker center. Keep using the needle tenderizer until the meat has flattened out a bit. I'll use a thicker piece of chicken breast later to demonstrate this more clearly. Next, use the meat tenderizing hammer or the mallet to spread the meat out a bit more. Some use a plastic wrap layer when they tenderize the chicken meat this way. I have no issue with that method, I just don't use that technique. With the meat tenderizing mallet, work in the same motion as the needle tenderizer. Work from thin to thick. Work in a side-by-side -side pattern when you're at the thinner part of the chicken breast. At the thicker part, work in a circular motion. Thinner chicken breast will not tear as much as their thicker counterpart. But since we're trying to even out the chicken breast, thicker cuts will tear a bit. But no worries. This is optional but I will trim my chicken breast meat to avoid any pieces of bone, cartilage, or connective parts that may provide an unfriendly crunch or chew during the meal. This is a much thicker piece of chicken breast. We're still going to work from thin to thick. Start with a needle tenderizer. Work from side to side on the thin side of the chicken breast. When you get to the thicker side of the chicken breast, work in a circular motion from outer to inner. You'll notice that the meat will start to thin out a bit as we use the needle tenderizer. Then with the meat tenderizing mallet, start at the thinner side, working side to side. 
When you reach the thicker end, work in a circular motion from outer to inner. This sideway view will show you how the meat is being thinned out. The essence of mechanically tenderizing chicken meat is to rip up the fibers to keep the meat from pulling together or tightening up during cooking. Do you see how the center of the thicker part seems to be torn up? That's okay. That's exactly what we're looking for. For thicker cuts, sometimes I'll flip the chicken breast over and tenderize the other side as well. This is optional. My suggestion is to always tenderize skin side up. And if you feel it needs additional tenderizing, to then do a second tenderizing bone side up. If you're thinking about chicken breast as a pyramid, we now have an even thickness from apex to base. Brining the chicken. There are two methods we use to create a brine, the cold method and the hot method. I'm going to show you the easier method, the cold method. There's two links in the description that will offer more information on brining the chicken. If you've never brined chicken breast meat before, my friends, this is a game changer. And it's easy, easy, easy. I brine with beer. And because beer is so expensive, I use zipper bags to brine in. It reduces the amount of beer I need to get the same job done. This is a gallon-sized zipper bag. This is a two and a half gallon size zipper bag. Depending on how many chicken breasts I'm preparing will depend on which bag I'm going to use. Four, maybe five chicken breasts will fit in that smaller bag, but if you've got six or more, I'd go with the larger bag. As a minimum, I use two 12 ounce beers to brine. Two chicken breasts and two 12 ounce beers or 24 ounces will do well, though I never brine less than four chicken breasts at a time. Depending on the size of those four chicken breasts, you may need to add a third 12 ounce beer. A fifth and sixth chicken breast would take about four 12 ounce beers. Seven or eight chicken breasts, you'll need about five 12 ounce beers. Start your brining journey with an easy drinking lager. Stick with a lower IBU beer. That's International Bitters Unit. That's how bitter or how hoppy the beer tastes. And those seven or eight chicken breasts will need about five 12 ounce beers. Sometimes one more to grow on is good to have. Like I said, not all chicken breasts are created equally. You may need more liquid and you may need less sometimes. You'll get a feel for this process the more you do it and become a better judge at how many beers you need to brine with. You absolutely cannot have a brine without salt. That's the essence of the brine. The salt is what drives the flavor deep into the meat. Remember this ratio, 12 to 1. For every 12 ounces of beer, add 1 tablespoon of salt. 12 ounces to 1 tablespoon. Your brine, if you decide to taste it, will be much saltier than the final saltiness of the meat. If you're asking why brine, let me use a clip from one of my past videos to help demonstrate. Brining works by the action of the salt, or well, there's a little bit more to it, and I go into depth on the webpage, but you remember junior high science class, right? Osmosis. Ringing any bells? The brine will have a higher salt concentration than the meat will have. Because of the pressure of the salty brine, the salt will be seeking to find balance and it'll want to migrate into the depths of that meat to find more ringing. Now that's simplistic speaking there, but you get the gist. And with that movement, that salt will take a few piggybacking beer and infused herb molecules along with it into the depths of that meat. Brining is like salting any meal. Take, for example, the pot of stew without any salt at all. It'll taste good, yeah, maybe, I guess. Then consider the teaspoon of salt. What if you were just to eat the salt all by itself? It would be overwhelming. You get the same salt in that pot of stew, right? But it doesn't overwhelm. It actually creates a stew with more flavor, or at least the sensation of more flavor. It makes it delicious. Brining is similar. The salt will infuse deep into the meat, and the flavors of the brine will follow. No, the meat's not going to taste as salty as that brine nowhere near, nor will it taste like beer. The beer, the salt, and the other ingredients in our brine will enhance the flavor of the meat we're eating. Our chicken's going to taste just like chicken, and the flavors of the brine will enhance that chicken's flavor and the texture. 
Remember that the liquid will follow the salt, and the salt in the meat will hold on to our moisture, and that means more tender and juicier meat. Use a large bowl to hold the bag of brine. Zipper bags leak sometimes. I'm going to brine with quite a few tenderized chicken breasts, both for tonight's recipe as well as for a few more recipes this week. I'm going to use the 2.5 gallon size zipper bag. First, add all the beer you plan on using for the brine. Be conservative in the number of beers you'll use. You can always put more beer in, but you can't take that beer back out. We can make more brine if we need to. I'm going to add all six beers for this example. That means I'm going to need six tablespoons of salt. I'm using pink salt, but plain white table salt will work perfectly. After adding the salt, zip up the bag and give it a good shaking. Mix up that salt really well. Undissolved salt will usually find its way to the corners of that zipper bag. We can add herbs and spices to our brine to give our chicken different flavors. Sometimes I like to add a little bit of liquid smoke. Be cautious in adding things that have salt as an ingredient. You may overdo it with the salt and your food may come out too salty. Check the labels for salt as an ingredient and also the amount of sodium in the product. For this brine, I'm going to add some poultry seasoning and some smoked paprika for some extra flavor. If you're adding herbs and spices, give the bag a bit of a shake to get everything stirred up real well. After your brine is all mixed up good, all you have to do now is add the tenderized chicken breasts. If you're enjoying this video, consider giving good old Sule a thumbs up, hitting that subscribe button, and giving a little ring on that dinner bell. Then zip up the bag. Give the bag a good shake and make sure the chicken is all separated and floating about in the brine. If you don't want to use as many beers for this brine, you can always use water or even chicken broth as a substitute. It seems silly to use chicken broth to flavor chicken, but it does create a nicer flavor than just water. Pay attention to the sodium levels of that broth if you're using broth. This broth has 520 milligrams of sodium per cup, but a tablespoon of salt has about 7,000 milligrams of sodium. A big separation there, but it will contribute to the saltiness. Notice the airspace around the bag. This is space that we would end up having to add more brine or beer to fill in if we weren't using the zipper bag. The zipper bag clenches up the chicken and creates a smaller area to get the same job done with less beer being wasted. Most meat would need to be brined for hours and hours or even days. This chicken breast is tenderized and been opened up to receive that brine quicker. Tenderizing the meat creates more surface area for the brine to be absorbed into. You will only brine tenderized chicken breast for one hour, only an hour. At least once and hopefully twice, give the bag a good shake to mix things up during that hour. After one hour, we're going to remove the chicken breast from the brine. I use a cooling rack over the sink for this process. You can use a paper towel and a tray if you like. Remove the chicken from the brine and lay the chicken breast out on the rack.
Take a thicker pad of paper towels and pat the chicken breast to remove the excess brine. You will never get them dry, nor do you want to dry them out. We're just removing the excess brine. Pat both sides of the meat. Don't overthink this process. Just dab it until the wetness is no longer reflecting as much light. They ain't pretty, I'll give you that. But wait a bit, we're gonna pretty things up just fine by the time they hit that plate. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to pre-prepare a few chicken breasts for easy meals later in the week. Take the tenderized, brined, and pat dried chicken breast and store them in the zipper bag. You can even use the same zipper bag you brined in. Set the bag flat. Layer in a few paper towels in that bag, like the pad in the packaging at the grocery store. And layer the chicken breast in slightly overlapping like shingles on a roof. Squeeze out the air and then wrap them up. How long will they last in that bag? I would suggest referring to the original expiration date, but we've modified this chicken, so my suggestion is for you to use your good judgment. Cooking the tenderized and brine chicken breast. This is a 10 and a quarter inch cast iron skillet. It's perfect for one or two chicken breasts. This 12 inch cast iron skillet is a good choice for two to three chicken breasts. And this 15 inch cast iron skillet is good for three or four chicken breasts. This is my favorite cast iron reversible grill griddle. It's an Asian piece I picked up for free many, many years ago. I've got others, but this one has the largest surface space. I'll explain where this grill griddle will come into play later. Consider a wired or wireless thermometer. These thermometers are much cheaper than you think, and you'll likely find that the cost of the meat is more expensive than the cost of one of these thermometers. Undercooked chicken is a no-go, we know that. Though safe to eat, overcooked chicken is a no-go as well. Using thermometers takes the guessing out of the equation and also lets you relax while the chicken is cooking. No worries is the only way to live, and likewise for cooking. We're going to sear and cook the chicken only part way in our skillet on the stovetop. Because we can't cook all the chicken breasts at one time in our skillet, we're going to brown and sear our thickest and biggest pieces first. Then we're gonna put them on that grill side of that grill griddle pan that's been preheated in a 350 degree Fahrenheit or 175 degrees Celsius oven. We're gonna use the grill side up. That's the side with the lines. Set the skillet over the fire and then place the grill griddle in the oven, grill side up. Add a bit of oil to the pan. About a tablespoon of oil per chicken breast will do the job. Add one cup of white flour to a large bowl, just flour. We've already salted and seasoned our chicken breast during the brining process. Add some pepper if you like. Dust both sides of the chicken breast, only a dusting, no crusting. Then add the floured chicken breast to the hot, hot skillet of oil. Don't try to add too many pieces at once. The broth will flow and the meat will end up boiling in its own juices. That's a no-go. We start with the thickest chicken breast fillets. They will take the longest to finish in the oven. The smaller pieces will go in last because they take less time to cook in the oven. Most of the time, they all end up coming out cooked just perfectly and all at the same time. When one side is browned and seared, flip the pieces and brown and sear the other sides. Now remove the half-cooked chicken breast and place it on the grill in the oven. 
The grill side will keep the meat elevated out of its juices the meat will render as it continues to cook. Then move on to the next pieces of chicken. Keep browning and searing until all the pieces of chicken are perfectly toasted. After you've seared and toasted the last piece, use the wired thermometer and skew one of the larger pieces of chicken or the last piece you placed in the oven. Use your best guess. Bake the chicken until each piece has been cooked to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 75 degrees Celsius. Yes, it's just that easy. Let's try this out. I'll use a knife at first so the cut looks all pretty. Nice. And just thick enough for a lot of different recipes, including awesome chicken sandwiches. Most of the time, I'm not gonna be using a knife. If I have to use a knife, I didn't tenderize it very well. I'm gonna use a fork. Oh, that's good. Think I'll have another bite. Yeah, good, good, good. And that's it, y'all. Do this process enough and you'll be lickety split quick with it. This is a base recipe that we'll use for many other recipes as well. Sometimes we'll just brown and sear that chicken and then bake it to temperature for our meal. Other times we'll add it to recipes like the coconut kale chicken or the chicken piccata. Give it a try and let me know how it turned out. If you've enjoyed this video, consider giving us a thumbs up, hitting that subscribe button, and giving a ring on that little dinner bell. Y'all keep cooking in those black beauties and enjoying those frosted glasses of those fermented barley pops. We'll see you next time on BeerAndIron.com.